thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Of course, this is a first for South Africa, but it's not a first for uh, with the World Economic Forum. You have similar centers. Look, the headquarters are in San Francisco um, as of 2017. So tell us exactly what the purpose of these centers are, how they have worked, um, what, what they've managed to achieve so far. Uh, the purpose of the center, the network now, is to ensure that the fourth industrial revolution benefits the broad society, not just the privileged people, right. because the gap is widening. And we decided to bring together academia, civil society, governments, mm -hmm. and uh, businesses to co-design the forward-looking policies. And because these technologies are moving much faster than we can cope mm -hmm. with, we said we need to be an accelerator. So we uh, launched San Francisco two years ago. It was highly successful. Sure. We worked with Rwanda to help with drone regulation. Uh. And now it's being scaled down. We opened centers in India, Japan, and China. And now we're uh, launching affiliate centers. Uh, we have announced them in United Arab Emirates, Colombia, and today in South Africa. All right, so quite, I mean, you're quite, quite spread there uh, across the world. But as you say, you've been working on this project since 2017, and innovation and technology has, has moved rapidly since Correct. then. Um, what are some of the policies that you've come up with since then? In addition to the drone policy, which is now being adopted in India and other uh, East African countries, as well as in the US, mm. we're working actively on data policy. Data which policy. is the new, people say it's the new oil, we say data is the new oxygen. Right. And who owns it, what you can do with it, and who gets rewarded are critical issues. And we have been working with several governments, including uh, Japan, India, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, mm -hmm. to help them define their forward-looking data policies. And that will be essential. We're also doing work on Internet of Things mm -hmm. to make sure that they can be deployed broadly and mm -hmm. we can collect data and improve energy consumption, agriculture yields, et cetera. So we have a number of projects that we have implemented. I mean, the, the, the issues around data, and particularly the ownership and the usage of data, um, I can see why that is quite top of the agenda, and especially as we've seen examples um, unfold around the world where uh, personal data has been used for uncomfortable things, i.e. The US, the US election. Yeah. Um, who ultimately uh, you know, does um, own this data? Are we, are we, are we saying that it's, it's, it's governments? Are we saying that it's business because you're inviting them to come on board? here. Um, yeah, who owns it and, and how, how, how will this be policed? Uh, that's the foundational question. Our approach is for the government to assign the ownership so they can say, if you own your gene data mm. and you can specify what it can be used for. If it's for cancer research, you probably don't want to be paid. All right. But if it's for drug discovery, you want to be asked for a consent and get paid. And there are different mechanisms of assigning a value to data, which we're working on again. Blockchain pr represents an interesting underlying technology to govern all of that in a flexible and scalable manner. And we're piloting those concepts in a number of countries. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing now data blocks emerging. Instead of having a universal global data policy, which is not going to be um, possible in the near future, we're looking at seeing countries in different continents getting together, pooling their data resources to advance their societies. Right. And then looking at inter-block data communications. Mm -hmm. And Prime Minister Abe of Japan called for that in his speech at the annual meeting in Davos this year. Right. And it will be a topic in the upcoming G20 meetings as well. All right. So now let's 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 talk about um, or more about the, the governance around this this is policy formation. Because just yesterday, uh, news in South Africa came out regarding Airbnb, and the, uh, the the formal sectors are quite concerned that you know Airbnb essentially operates as uh, as a law unto itself, in the sense that there is no regulation. If I just want to open my home for an Airbnb, I can. I don't have to you know tick any boxes like a hotel or a guest company. Um, so they're trying to regulate that space a little bit, but they did receive backlash because the, the public is saying now you're trying to stifle innovation or regulate innovation. Um, but to an one degree, it has to be regulated, but to the other, it can't be seen to protect traditional or established industries. I imagine that uh, striking that balance is, is, is going to be quite difficult. It is uh, difficult, but not impossible. Our approach is to remain uh, human-centric. What we mean by that is let's look at the benefit uh, for the citizens and society and walk backwards and say, what are the underlying governance protocols and policies needed? Do these pilots rapidly in 18 months? If they work, then we can scale it. And if you look at the traditional way we have governed these technologies, it's been mostly reactive, much mm. like Airbnb. Mm. By the time we react, it's too late. So we're saying let's take a forward-looking approach and do pilots rapidly not take years, mm -hmm. but 18 months. And if they work, then we can scale it. That, I think, with this approach, we can get ahead of the technology curve sure. and create an inclusive future for everyone.
the job the job impact is going to be uh, quite something that I think will be topical because I mean a lot of these industries that are exploiting the advantages of, of, of technology uh, making a business more more efficient and easier to do um, are doing so at the expense of, of, of jobs because I mean why employ someone that I don't need anymore I'm interested in, in some of the conversations you have been having at the other centers where you know jobs have been lost as, as a result of, of, of innovation. I mean, is there going to be a, a, a policy uh, to, to, to stop business from, from, from doing so or to do so in a manner in which they, they look for those ne new industries that technology will create and take those that, that employment pool into those new industries? How are you going to navigate yeah. the jobs effect? We expect a tremendous skills gap for the jobs of the future that these mm. technologies will require versus what we have today. And if you look at healthcare, for example, delivery of healthcare in hospitals in India and South Africa and emerging countries, you don't have enough physicians to look after the people. With these technologies, with machine learning and AI uh, type technologies enabled by data access, we can deliver these services to hundreds of millions of people, not just a few. So from a society impact perspective, it's going to be positive. In terms of jobs, if you look at what we did in Rwanda, we helped them scale their drone implementation, and they're going to need drone technicians, drone landing sites, drone programmers. And Carnegie Mellon opened a campus in Kigali to, drain, to train the society and the mm. young people for the jobs of the future. So I don't think anyone can predict what kind of jobs are needed. Mm. The only way to know is by doing that and scaling it, then we can train our young people and the elderly towards the jobs of the future that we know are needed not the ones that we predict. So there will be a skills gap and it's sure. important for the policymakers to be deliberate about retraining our employees and also re, uh, changing the education system for the young people. Sure. Has anything been mentioned around uh, taxing or taxation policy in the fourth industrial revolution? How is that going to work? Um, it, there are different ideas. Mm. Um, I think we try to shy away from individual point solutions because it can create a systemic effect. One of the taxation-related issues is in 3D printing. Right. I just saw at CSIR a 3D printed titanium drawn frame, which is more durable and lighter than anything else. Mm -hmm. So if you look at 3D printing, you're in effect taking raw materials and printing the finished products at the moment of consumption. So there is no semi-finished goods or finished goods crossing the borders. Sure. So how do you tax raw materials? when the end product is being delivered near moment of consumption. These are tricky questions. Yes. How do you pay back the owner of the design? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that the design is uh, authentic? And how do you handle cross-border payments? And this will probably create a whole new set of products. Mm. Imagine young people or old people in villages designing products, putting them into a marketplace. Anyone in the world can buy it, download the recipe, have it 3D printed. If we can pull mm. it off, we can get hundreds of millions of people who are now not in big cities and not engaged in this sure. economic development engaged, but it requires a deliberate, again, forward-looking taxation and trade policies, mm -hmm. unlike the ones that we're working on. Today, yes. Gosh, I mean, quite a lot of conversations I can see that you guys are having and you will continue we to We cannot have. sleep, yes. <laughs> <laughs> rest is good. Get some that's rest, true, that's please. True, uh, that's thanks true. so much for your time. My However, pleasure. That was Murad Sonmez, who is a member of the Managing Board and the head of the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Global Network.